obviously. The station master, not moving with the train, must be writing saying that he heard the shot at the guard first. We who live on the earth would naturally in such a case prefer the view of simultaneity obtained from a person travelling in a train. But in theoretical physics no such parochial prejudices are permissible. A physicist on a comet, if there were one, would have just as good a right to a view of simultaneity as an earthly physicist has. But the results would differ, in just the same sort of way as on our train. When we are defining simultaneity between distant events, we have no right to pick and choose among different bodies to be used in defining the point halfway between the events. All bodies have an equal right to be chosen. But if, for one body, the two events are simultaneous according to the definition, there will be other bodies for which the first precedes the second, and still others for which the second precedes the first. We cannot say, unambiguously, that two events in distant places are simultaneous. Such a statement only acquires a definite meaning in relation to a definite observer. The universal cosmic time, which used to be taken for granted, is no longer admissible. For each body, there is a definite time order for the events in its neighbourhood. This may be called the proper time for that body. Our own experience is governed by the proper time for our own body. As we all remain very nearly stationary on the earth, the proper times of different human beings agree and can be lumped together as terrestrial time. But this is only the time appropriate to large bodies on the earth. For electrons, quite different times would be wanted. It is because we insist upon using our own time that these particles seem to increase in mass with rapid motion. From their point of view, their mass remains constant, and it is we who suddenly grow thin or corpulent. The history of a physicist, as observed by an electron, would resemble Gulliver's travels. The question now arises, what really is measured by a clock? When we speak of a clock in the theory of relativity, we do not mean only clocks made by humans. We mean anything which goes through some regular, periodic performance. The earth is a clock, because it rotates once a day. An atom is a clock, because it emits light waves of very definite frequencies. The world is full of periodic occurrences, and fundamental mechanisms such as atoms show an extraordinary similarity in different parts of the universe. But the question remains. If cosmic time is abandoned, what is really measured by a clock in the wide sense that we have just given to the term? Each clock gives a correct measure of its own proper time. But it does not give an accurate measure of any physical quantity connected with events on bodies that are moving rapidly in relation to it. It gives one part of a physical quantity connected with such events, but another part is required. And this has to be derived from measurement of distances in space. Distances in space, like periods of time, are in general not objective physical facts, but partly dependent upon the observer. We must think of the distance between two events, not between two bodies. This follows from what we have found as regards time. If two bodies are moving relatively to each other, and this is really always the case, the distance between them will be continually changing, so that we can only speak of the distance between them at a given time. If you are in a train, travelling towards Edinburgh, we can speak of your distance from Edinburgh at a given time. But, as we said, different observers will judge differently as to what is the same time for an event in the train and an event in Edinburgh. This makes the measurement of distances relative, in just the same way as the measurement of times has been found to be relative. We commonly think that there are two separate kinds of interval between two events, an interval of space and an interval in time. Between your departure from London and your arrival in Edinburgh, there are 700 kilometres and five hours. As we have discussed, other observers will judge the time differently. It is even more obvious that they will judge the distance differently. An observer on the sun 
will think the motion of the train quite trivial and will judge that you have travelled the distance travelled by the earth in its orbit. On the other hand, a flea in the railway carriage will judge that you have not moved at all in space, but have afforded it a period of feasting which it will measure by its proper time, not by GMT. It cannot be said that you or the sun-dweller or the flea are mistaken. Each is equally justified. The distance in space between two events is therefore not in itself a physical fact. But, as we shall see, there is a physical fact which can be inferred from the distance in time together with the distance in space. This is what is called the interval in space-time. For any two events in the universe, there are two different possibilities as to the relation between them. It may be physically possible for a body to travel so as to be present at both events, or it may not. This depends upon the fact that no body can travel as fast as light. Suppose, for example, that a flash of light is sent from the earth and reflected back from the moon. The time between the sending of the flash and the return of the reflection will be about two and a half seconds. No body could travel so fast as to be present on the earth during any part of those two and a half seconds and also present on the moon at the moment of the arrival of the flash because in order to do so, the body would have to travel faster than light. When it is physically impossible for a body to travel so as to be present at both events, we shall say that the interval between the two events is space-like. When it is physically possible for a body to be present at both events, we shall say that the interval between the two events is time-like. When the interval is space-like, it is possible for a body to move in such a way that an observer on the body will judge the two events to be simultaneous. In that case, the interval between the two events is what such an observer will judge to be the distance in space between them. When the interval is time-like, a body can be present at both events. In that case, the interval between the two events is what an observer on the body will judge to be the time between them. That is to say, it is the proper time between the two events. There is a limiting case between the two when the two events are part of one light flash, or we might say when the one event is the seeing of the other. In that case, the interval between the two events is zero. The interval between two events is a physical fact about them, not dependent upon the particular circumstances of the observer. There are two forms of the theory of relativity, the special and the general. Special is used in the sense of limited to special circumstances. It is, in most circumstances, only approximate, but becomes very nearly exact at great distances from gravitating matter. That came first. Einstein later developed the wider general theory, which can cope with gravitational matter. Whenever gravitation may be neglected, the special theory can be applied, and then the interval between two events can be calculated when we know that distance in space and the distance in time between them estimated by any observer. The special theory lets us describe one interval in space-time, that is, space-time, which replaces the two intervals in space and time of the older physics. Before dealing further with the special theory of relativity, I want to try to convey to the reader what is involved in the new phrase space-time, because that is, from a philosophical and imaginative point of view, perhaps the most important 